And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, the man better known as Salty, and the cre and the creator of the upcoming science fantasy TTRPG, New Edo, the one and the one and only Russell Rollins. How are you doing today, man? Good, Mildred. Thanks for having me. If uh, if I'd known that uh, this was supposed to be a bit more lit up, I would have suggested we do that 11 p.m. instead of 11 a.m. <laughs> Maybe, maybe we'll do that for round two, but uh, probably just as well if you actually want to get any useful information out of me today that we don't have it after 10 pints. <laughs> uh, men, I, I am a, I'm a patriot, and, 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 much, and much, of, much of early business was, was done through, a whole, through Ben Franklin doing a whole lot of boozing. <laughs> well, I tell you what, it, there, there's certainly a parabola in business and uh, in communication, much like playing pool. After a couple of pints, things get easier, and it's only, only after a couple more after that that it starts to go downhill. So there's some math in there that we can talk about later on, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to open up with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Walk, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Uh, this is actually a great story. I didn't realize you're going to ask, you know, the origin stories of Russ and not the origin stories of New Edo, but, oh, we'll, uh, we'll get to that. I just, well, it's just uh, one part at a time. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so I, I am a geek and always have been. Um, and I remember going to grade nine in high school and knowing of and reading Dragonlance books. This is back in the early nineties, but never having played Dungeons and Dragons heard of it. I think I had the AD&D box set with the red dragon on the front, uh, taking it apart, built dungeons and all of that, but I didn't know anybody that would play with me, including my family. Bless their hearts. So I go to grade nine, and I'm sitting next to a, a kid that would turn out to be a jock kid, uh, but you know, we got chatting about what our books were going to be for the English class, and we both were reading Dragonlance books, and so we geeked out on Dragonlance for a while. Mm -hmm. And he and I became buddies... And neither one of us had ever actually played Dungeons and Dragons, but we'd read every goddamn Dungeons and Dragons book under the sun. Mostly specifically, sorry, um, Dragonlance. Mm -hmm. And he and I were sitting in health class, I don't know, a month later, talking about Dungeons and Dragons and, you know, oh, well, this, that, and the other. And, you know, I guess I had some rule books, but had never played. And this kid behind us pipes up. He says, hey, are you making fun of me? And, and Brandon and I kind of turn and look at this, this squat young man and uh, like, what? What, dude? Are you making fun of me, man? What are you talking about Dungeons and Dragons for? Like, well, I don't, we, don't know what, we don't know what it is, man. Do you play Dungeons and Dragons? And he was so defensive, this kid behind us. He, he thought that we were trolling him, uh, even though nobody knew anybody at this high school at the time. And certainly we weren't, uh, you know, uh, the big strapping types that like to pick on kids, that's for sure. So uh, the kid behind me, us, his name is Chris, uh, ended up being a longtime D&D &D player and said, eventually after he got over his defensive caution, said, oh, okay, well, I'll run a game for you guys. And we formed a group of grade nine D&D &D nerds to which, you know, Chris was the DM and, and introduced us to this world. Uh, and Chris and I went on to play every, well, I mean, for about 20 more years, every D, uh, role-playing game under the sun, and we became best friends. Uh, we're in our early 40s now, and we continue to talk about games, play games when we get a chance. We have very divergent life paths. But uh, he's been, I think it was a relationship with somebody with a very similar outlook that could buffer the world's judgment, I think. <laughs> that really made it uh, stick with me. And, I mean, that circle of friends that I met through d and in grade 9, um, we're all still close. Uh, you know, I moved away for a while, different cities, not different countries. Uh, we all stopped playing games, mostly with each other, but some people just stopped altogether. And, uh, but that the socializing aspect of it, especially in the 90s when 
this wasn't an accepted hobby. You know, you had to be ashamed of playing RPGs at that time. Um, that that really that really buffered it into my psyche, I think. And and then the relationship with Chris as bestie of mine really helped over the years with just a sounding board and a creative outlook and and all of that. So I think it's easy to say that it was certainly um, uh, developmental for me in my teen years. Mm-hmm. So with the now, when it comes to that, were you did you mainly stick with D and D over over the years, or did you jump around between systems? No, so started with D and D and played that for a handful of years through high school, and then got into the world of darkness systems, mm-hmm. uh, specifically whatever version of Vampire was out in nineteen ninety seven or six that, or eight or something would, along those that would lines. Be the masquerade. Sure. Yep. And then all of its derivative product products over the the, the next handful of years. Um, but in high school, also played some Deadlands. Um, uh, whatever the Star Wars game was out at the time, I apologize. I don't have a, a pedantic um, memory about all can, of these. If, if you can give me a year, I might be able to narrow it down. Uh, 98, 97, 97. That'd be D6. Sure. Yeah, I, I don't even remember the systems. I just remember having an amazing um, ship combat and ship building system, which I really geeked out on. I think partially because it was so dramatically different than anything that Dungeons and Dragons or or the World of Darkness system had on offer. I don't know if it's good because I have not really compared it to anything else, to be honest. But I remember just loving the ship and vehicle based stuff in that system. Um, so so I ended up playing World of Darkness, predominantly vampire, but every every book they published for between ninety six and two thousand six, I had. Um, and some of them were good, some of them were far from good, but but the world was really, especially coming from a hack and slash game like Dungeons and Dragons, where you're set on a path where the goal is to destroy everything until you get to the end, destroy it, and then go home. Vampire, on the other hand, was such a storytelling game, uh, and I played it quite often with just two people, and it was just a, it was almost like narrative, or sorry, co-op narrative book writing. Sure, there was some combat thrown in, and you know, and the story types would change over the years. But that system, I think, was probably the most influential on me over the over the next well, whatever the rest of my gaming career has been. Mm-hmm. Now, I um, I will I will note I hope when you mentioned um, dipping into World of Darkness, my my first thought was, I hope to God he didn't dip into Mage. <laughs> Tell you what, I have a Mage book sitting beside me here on my desk that I haven't cracked, whatever the recent edition is. Uh, because I've always been fascinated by Mage, the system with, compared to Dungeons and Dragons, it's infinite possibility of magic, but I've never actually played a campaign. So oh. I certainly had those books and was influenced by it back in the day, but I, I don't remember. Well, I certainly didn't play it. Um, is there a particular hatred on for, for that game or its systems? Not not necessarily. Um, Mage is Mage is just in, Mage is just infamous for how for how broken it can, for how broken it can get. Mm. Um, largely largely because of how um, free how free form its magic is. Um, that, yeah, and that's why I continue to buy it because I mean we can get into this later. Nuido is meant to be one geographic system uh, from a larger world of games Mm -hmm. in which I would like to expand on my magic systems. And I was always inspired by the loose rules or however you want to call it flexibility of the mage systems. But I can certainly see how balance and parameters are going to be hard to control with something like that. Mm -hmm. And since we, since we've, since we've gotten, since we've gotten to that front, um, Talk to me about the origin story of New Edo, because there's a whole lot of things that we're combining into one pot here. Right. So New Edo, and, and to clarify, the Edo is in reference to the previous name of the city of Tokyo, not to the Edo era. Mm-hmm. So it is the new city of Edo, as it were. That confusion has come up a few times, which causes thematic and historical perspective problems. Not problems, just and so, uh, for anyone that's curious, it is in reference to the city. Um, I set out in my mid-30s to go travel around the world. I had no wife, no kids, no debt, not a lot of money. Um, my, my, my job had just offered me a promotion 
And it was one of those promotions where if I took it, I would have been handcuffed for the rest of my life. You know, go out and buy a fancy house or a car and end up with kids in private school and just be stuck to a very good, but not for me, career path for the rest of my life. So I said, eh, I tell you what, hit pause on that. No promotion. I quit. I'm going to go sail around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and ended up doing exactly that. I, I had never slept on a boat before. Uh, I had done week night racing on sailboats out of Toronto. I uh, was far from an expert, didn't grow up around boats. First time I set foot on a sailboat was only four or five years prior to that. Um, but it was just an adventure and something to do with what little money I had in my thirties with no obligations. And, you know, I knew I'd be able to come back and make more money in the future, but you can't make more time. So I thought, fuck it. This is the right time. Off I go. Mm -hmm. Um, so I found myself in Panama waiting to catch a small sailboat to sail to Australia, at least in a long-term potential. And Panama is a cool city. It, It evokes a very much like a, I don't know, a global espionage, Cold War sort of spy novel vibe. Uh, And I had always known that I wanted to take my fiction and and, uh, amend it into things that I could could give firsthand experience to based on my travels. And I thought a spy novel would be a great way to do that. Uh, You know, kind of a lark, uh, an adventure novel, but still espionage based. And I started writing it, and it turns out I have trouble taking things seriously. I just couldn't write seriously enough to make it not sound like Austin Powers or some spoof. Um, you know, it was it was a novel that was, I don't know, it, it tried to be serious, but I, I'm just not a serious person. So I thought, well, <laughs> you know, I, I'm at this point, I'm in the middle of the Pacific on a boat with two other guys with thousands of miles between me and land. And three, well, we ended up spending 28 days at sea. So I had nothing but time. So I just scratched out everything I'd done and reskinned the book into a science fantasy adventure novel uh, based on a character called RASP, which is just an acronym for Robot Anarchist Space Pirate bracket from the future. So a time-traveling robotic anarchist space pirate. And the, there's an origin story there that I won't go into now. Anyways, I traveled for months and took samples of people and places and wrote them into characters and places in this adventure novel. Uh, The adventure novel is originally set in Toronto, because that's really the only place in the world I was familiar with. But it had Valkyries and Harpies and Mermaids and Gods and Wizards and Technology. And it was just a... I wasn't trying to write a book that would be for anyone's taste, pardon me, but was just something for me to get all the crazy crap in my brain out onto paper as, as a, a first crack at writing. Um, and then, you know, refine that later on if, and when I so choose mm-hmm. chose, pardon me. So fast forward from a few months of travel and I land by serendipity in Tokyo. Um, and I step off of the train after a 45 minute ride from the airport and I'm like bombarded by Tokyo whose population is the same as that of Canada. Mm. Um, and I had, I had ended up there by accident. I didn't really aim for Japan at all. Uh, and so I hadn't prepared in any way, shape, or form about what, 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 what I was going to be facing. Everyone knows Tokyo is a big city and Japan is a busy country and blah, blah, blah. But, but I was wholly overwhelmed uh, my first couple of well, footsteps and, and hours in Tokyo because I had just come from four months of relative solitude and much peace and quiet uh, on a little boat in little islands. And then, you know, the 35 million people in Tokyo, as very polite as they are, was uh, bombarded me. So I took that opportunity to go to a little seaside town um, called Atami and sit down to try to re- figure out what I was going to do for the next few weeks, months, whatever it turned out to be, and rejig my story because I suddenly knew that it had to be set in Tokyo. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't, you know, it, the world audience of Toronto, if anyone has an opinion at all, and I love the city, mm-hmm. is that, oh, that's a clean, safe place to go, isn't it? It doesn't exactly light up your imagination with adventure and chaos and, 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 and fireworks. Uh, but 
Tokyo, you could just say Tokyo, and even if you've never been there, people can just picture it. Now, that picture may be wrong, probably, probably is wrong, but uh, the picture is of neon lights and hus- bustling crowds and trains everywhere and uh, tall towers and more neon lights and signs and over-the-top personalities and crazy clothes. And while that's only a very small portion of Tokyo, that's the kind of setting that my fiction needed. Somewhere where if a Valkyrie and a mermaid were having a beer in a bar, you'd think, yeah, that's fine. Sure, I could totally see that here. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started to reskin my fiction onto Tokyo casually mm-hmm. and would write back home to my family saying, hey, guys, I've changed my story. Here's what's going on. And, and my brother uh, studied gaming for his PhD in sociology. He said, man, I want to play a character in that world. And it occurred to me like uh, like a eureka moment, like oh, this should definitely be a game. Not s- don't start with the fiction and then write the game. Start with the game and then write the fiction based on the parameters that the game gives you. Mm-hmm. It 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 sets sets framework for your fiction. And I mean, uh, maybe all the, the the good fiction writers do this. You, you you make a game with some rules, and that makes it a lot easier to frame your fiction. So that's when I started to then set systems about um, the world I'd created in my fiction. If that's not long enough of an answer, I don't know what would be. Uh, and then we can get down into what my early goals were or anything like that. But that's the genesis of Nuido as a game. Yeah. Now, taking taking that into account, um, you're g- going with... Going with um... Going with this mix of samurai and and science fantasy, I um, I will admit I did make the mistake early. <coughs> Sorry, wrong pipe. Making the mistake early on of of um of making some cyberpunk comparisons, but that's simply that's simply my own um, my own ha- my own habits on that front. No. no, that that's that's to, to, just to jump in here. That's not your fault. That's I mean the 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 visual thematics of of Nuido are. I'd be an idiot to try to suggest that there's not tons of overlap with things like small C cyberpunk games or or other um, neon urban games. I've taken to calling them, uh, and I don't blame anybody for those those uh, analogies or similarities or you know trying to lump them together. That's wholly reasonable, just based on seeing a name, seeing some of the art that I've used, uh, just the, the, my catchphrase of Neon Samurai, of course you're going to think Cyberpunk. Yeah. Sorry, but I interrupted you. No no, wor- no worries on that front. Um, but what I... But one, th- one, thing that I wa- one thing that I wanted to... Want, wanted to ask on that front is... What is the... Go- is... You've set. You've early meant you on the start of the Kickstarter. You mentioned a goal of Clem, crunchy, light, easy, easily managed. Um, what's the or, what was the origin for that particular ethos? I guess I'll say. And how do you pl- how do you plan on following through on that with the game proper? So th- that stems from uh, I'm the kind of guy that will go back and restart a Skyrim campaign just to play it with a different character. Or if I've got a Dungeons and Dragons one shot coming up, I'll spend twenty hours making a level one character wherein there really are only two options. What race and what class. I just love the act of character creation, the the creative process, backstories, uh, little unique aspects of it. I'm sure it's a pain in the ass for anybody that has to storytell or or dungeon master these characters, because I'm one of those guys that has this big backstory. Uh, not that I try to force it in, but just I love the process and I get attached to my characters. Mm-hmm. Dungeons and Dragons is not a rewarding system for that. So I then went out and started poking around other systems. Obviously, being familiar with World of Darkness helps because that's a fairly fluid system. Uh, but I kind of spent the time from 2006 or seven to 2017 not playing tabletop RPGs just based on where my life was at. Um, and I'm not a particularly digital guy, and so I haven't really kept up or hadn't really kept up on what was out there. So at that point, I got into asking questions around what are some of the best you know, character builder games, and, and that was the first time that I ever heard the phrase priority buy. Mm-hmm. 
um, Priority Boy, what's that? And someone handed me a, a copy of Elric. And I fell in love with that concept. Like, that just lit up my character loving imagination. Like, oh, so I could make a wizard, but I could say if I want him to be a beefy bench press wizard or not. He might be a little bit nerfed because of that, but, but if that's the theme I want to go, it's I'm not ruining the character. Sure, a tiny nerf, but but it's not. It's still it's still feasible, um, unlike you know class based systems. Mm -hmm. So the crunchy light part of Clem is in specific reference to character creation. Uh, anyone that has not uh, got, had the time to go and read through or at least browse through the quick start that's available on our website uh, will see that character creation is quite an involved process, especially for someone coming from a class based system or who's not familiar with priority buy. Um, very briefly, priority buy is if you take all of the general concepts of a character, their core traits, you know, your strengths and dexterities and intelligence, that type of stuff, their skills. Um, uh, Nuido uses both cybernetic augmentations and magic. So those are two categories. And backgrounds, uh, context for your character. And you assign a priority between A and E to each one of those. And each priority in each one of those classes of, of abilities uh, gives you a certain amount of points to spend on your character. And this system is entirely separate from the very loose, the phrasing is wrong, but race and class based system that we're all familiar with. So you still get to assign some fundamentals to your character, what their physiology are and what their loose role will be in the world of Nuido. Mm -hmm. And then from there you build on uh, what you think the priority should be. Certainly there's a, it's, a, it's min max or heaven mm -hmm. if you want to do that. But it gives you the flexibility to create a the bench press wizard, the 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 geeky cybernetic operative, the you know the the uh, scoundrel with a heart of gold cop, you know whatever it may be. There's there's a lot of depth that the priority buy system offers, mm -hmm. but it's undoubtedly crunchy, especially if you're coming from a, a narrative game or a class based game. Yeah. And per the per second part easily managed. Sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say personally, I've. I've seen a I've seen a lot of people act act as if uh, act as if crunch is something that something that should be avoided. I have no, I have no I have always argued that crunch is not the devil. Um, it's all in the implementation. Exactly right, and so I have played some. I, I don't want to name names here as far as systems, and 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 I'm not trying to pillory anybody because everybody likes what their certain games. But there's other neon urban games and some Dungeons and Dragons esque games that are famously systems heavy um, such that you might have a ton of fun creating your character but then either you or your dungeon master or storyteller or whomever uh, will have a hell of a time playing through a scene efficiently <clears throat> so I wanted to create all this character creation depth but then when it actually came time to get something done you could get through a combat or a, a deep intrigue or a tense scene without having to refer to charts or without the poor dungeon master having to go through and flip through books to see how this character got this specific power and are they using it right and that, is that the right amount of modifiers to add to it? So the excuse me, I need to get a glass of water in a second. Um, the easily managed goal was to take all of that depth and and crunch from character creation and still make it a streamline adventure game. It's far from a narrative game. Um, but it is definitely one where an even new players can come in, sit down, take some time to make the character, but then go through a fun combat scene just to introduce them to the world and have it flow smoothly, not get bogged down in references and adding tables and, and all of that. And, and I've, been, I've been pretty pleased with, after many years of iterations, how, how that Clem goal has, has shaken out. Can I ask you, sorry, to, to pause here just for a second? You do need to grab a glass of water. I hope that's okay. Oh yeah, go ahead. So, get so getting into that. Getting into that. Um, now, when it, the one of the core one of the core things aside from the aside from the priority system is the is the system of lineages and paths. Um, which I think would be analogous to races and classes, respe respectively, in other games. Um, what I'm cu what I'm curious about what I'm curious about is what e what each one what each one is go is going to add. Since 
the bad way to do races, in my opinion, is ju is just a um a modifier to co to core ability scores, for instance. Okay. Um. So what I'm what I'm curious about is what is what um what the what the rate what the choice of lineage is going to bring to the table and what the choice of um path is going to bring to the, is going to bring to the table obviously there's going to be more with the latter uh i don't know i think that they're probably fairly even no 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 there's going to be more with the paths but let's start the lineages um the lineages are all entirely uh creatures from well almost entirely creatures from japanese mythology mm -hmm. uh some things that that fans will certainly be familiar with uh kitsune and oni and some less common uh, creatures from lore. Um, and this stems from my fantasy gaming route, or, uh, where the variety is fun. Mm -hmm. uh, this game, if you recall back to whatever my ramblings were 20 minutes ago about wanting the world to be full of, or the world was inevitably going to be full of over-the-top characters. And while I was on, at sea, those were Valkyries and Sirens and Mermaids. Uh, but after I came to refine this concept down, I thought, okay, well, Nuido is specifically a, a Japanese analog game. Um, so let's let's make sure that it sticks to, to local myth loosely-ish. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the lineages are your physiological root of your character. So... An Oni is a large demon-like character, but again, only physiological here. And a Tanuki is a small raccoon fox dog-like character. Mm -hmm. um, they have personalities, but obviously nothing is prescriptive. You know, if you want to play a boisterous, goofy Oni, I I'm not going to be the one to tell you not to. And, I'm, and the language in the book certainly makes it clear that, he, you know, there's some tropes of these entities, but go nuts and do what you want. You know, the world is full of personalities, and this game is certainly built for big personalities. Mm -hmm. um, each of the lineages provides some, what, what I call, phys physiological bonuses. You know, your, your core stats or an ability that they're particularly good at, or extra health, or a connection to, to magic, or something like that, that are, you know, those are, those are born traits. And then each of them also has two cultures which is a name that I may end up changing for the final print version. But w those are learned behaviors, uh, such that, you know, the, the Tanuki, for example, the raccoon critters, they, they've got two, two cultures. One adds to their savvy and intelligence clone um, and, and also gives them a higher crit chance. And their second culture adds to their heart, their fortitude, and you gain a bonus to your defense, both social and physical, when you and your allies are outnumbered. They're, mm -hmm. they're brave creatures. But those are both learned abilities, uh, such that if, as part of the priority by process during character creation, you can spend a few points to take the learned abilities from a different lineage. So some of it's baked in. You know, if you're a raccoon person, you can't help but look a little bit like a raccoon and probably be smaller. Um, if you're an Oni, if you're a demon, you're, you're going to be a larger entity, but you can, for whatever backstory, personal preference reason, purchase the option to, to take a learned ability from a different lineage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are skins for your character with some personality thrown in with enough minimal crunch variety that will let you start to optimize into like gameplay mm -hmm. if you so choose or just create a character that you love because of some media some other media that you may have encountered something like this. um the, the game is in, intentionally designed to have a lot of uh internal networking mm -hmm. um synergies be between characters and in between your own character's abilities such that certainly some of the lineages have uh optimized synergies with certain play styles um, and I won't go into it here, but, but it is, you know, if you're a min-maxer or an, I like to use the word optimizer and I tend to be one personally, mm -hmm. um, that, that some, some of the lineages are better than others at certain roles in, in a, in a game group. But 
choosing that will not break your your character you won't always be a step behind um uh, another one because there's just so much variety here and with now when it comes to when it comes to um pat when it comes to paths i i first noticed that they're um that they're that they are divided between um divided between different factions and obviously go, obviously going into to to all of the all the factions isn't isn't something that could, isn't something that could be done but when it comes to what a what an individual path um grants the to be honest given given how it given the way it's written given the way it's written I couldn't help but be reminded of the school system in Legend of the Five Rings, as well, and, and to a certain extent, Seventh Sea as well. So I have played Legend of Five Rings. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've read more of it than I've played it, and I love it. I mean, it would obviously, it would be a lie to suggest that there is no influence of that on this game. And I've had a few comments to say, you know, can, can I use your setting as a L five R future? Um, and a lot of it would transfer over fairly comfortably from a table that's familiar with L5R. Um, th the paths are, sorry, the factions are exactly that. They're not just groups. They are groups with a political goal in mind. So not every character has to choose a path, and we'll get to that in a sec, mm -hmm. that's part of a faction. But there are five factions with uh, agendas in the game uh, in the game world uh, that if you choose to choose play one of the paths from within that faction you there will be pressure on your character to get something done to drive in a certain direction to have some motivation to seek out goals you may have a boss or a handler or something like that uh, it adds role-playing depth without intending again to you know railroad your characters actually on my the discord channel the Nuido discord channel we got into a, quite an in-depth debate i think it was last weekend between a few active members about whether or not the path tied to factions railroads characters and subsumes player choice into faction politics it was i love the discussion there's no right answer because yeah if you want to play a you know if you want to play an operative you know a, a cybernetic warrior basically let's call it from uh, the the tekken alliance mm -hmm. the tekken alliance is a faction that propagates futurism in nuido uh the acceptance of technology progressive reform uh you know 21st and 22nd century politics economics uh you know their their ideologues for the future mm -hmm. um that's not to say that they're the good guys or the bad guys but they are definitely fostering for change in an empire that has not changed dramatically in hundreds, if not thousands of years. Mm -hmm. The world is fleshed out significantly. I don't know if we have time to get into a lot of it, um, but this isn't just, you know, Tokyo 2050. This is an alternate history of blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. So you, you create an operative, capital O operative, which is a path, and it gives you some powers some loose abilities and those loose abilities uh flavor what play style you may choose to use that operative for I, to be to be blunt they're tanky mm. uh but and tech tanky so you can rely on them to be quite efficient by loading them up with cybernetic augmentations and throwing them in the front line of a battle uh but that's not based on a priority buy system and the loose definitions of what these abilities are, it certainly is nothing railroading you. It's not like you were the only guy with, it doesn't change your, your quote unquote hit points. Um, it, you know, it doesn't, it, the decision of how you play that operative comes more down to your, your path or sorry, your, your trait and skill decisions. Uh, then, then just you know, forcing you to be like, oh, I'm a barbarian. I use an axe. I rage, or anything like that. I know that's a very ham-fisted analogy. Um, so the paths are loose guidelines for how you want to play, and the factions, fr frankly, they create they create RP and context depth, but also differentiate between, say, uh, two paths which may be fairly martial, just from a surface observation. 
well, this one looks like it uses guns, this one looks like it uses guns, which one should I choose? Well, choose one based on your faction, then. Which politics interests you more, uh, or may interest you more, or something along those lines. So the combination of faction and paths mean that there's game color built in that will flavor paths or play styles that may otherwise be a little bit similar. Uh, in, in my mind, it gives role-playing in, in, in depth, um, character choice depth, player choice depth. Uh, but, but certainly there's been opinions voiced that somebody said, I want to play a, you know, an operative that behaves like a samurai, like a, you know, an old Edo-era samurai and doesn't like technology. And I said, well, you can play whatever you want. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not going <laughs> to say what people can and couldn't do. But it's um, the 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 social context in game is that 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 operative would be a bit of a pariah within their faction, um, and it would create role playing depth of why you would be that, what would happen if you did that, and none of that is meant to say you can't or you shouldn't. Just that that creates an opportunity at your table to describe why you're a cybernetic operative that doesn't have any cybernetics and doesn't want to foster change in the city. If that's a long-winded enough answer, <laughs> I um I usually anticipate long-winded answers. Fair enough. Gives you time to get up, stretch your back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure lo 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 lots of devs don't just sit here and give you two sentence answers and, and wait for the next question. No, I no I um though I, I I count on lengthy answers because if because devs have a lot of stuff that's jammed in that's jammed in their head. Yeah. Yep. Um. But in 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 the in the spirit in the spirit of that, I would like I would like to go over go over briefly some of the other factions. You already mentioned the Tekun Alliance is essentially be, essentially being um a cult of futurism. Mm -hmm. Okay, cult might be a bit har might be a bit harsh, but you get the point. Mm -hmm. Um. But I'd like to go through some of the other factions and their and their particular vibes. Sure. So uh, I'll try to be much briefer. Mm -hmm. um, we'll start with the uh, ICO. Yeah, the ICO are kind of set diametrically opposed in the past versus future conflict, which is one of New Edo's conflicts. Mm -hmm. uh, the ICO are traditionalists. There's three paths that give you different flavors of traditionalists and different play styles in there, but these are um, citizens who wish to hold on to the Empire's pa uh, tr traditions and past. Um, I mean, and, and we're talking Bushido, classic duty, honor, glory, um, and the th those are the traditions that have maintained the empire's strength for all of her thousands of years of history. Um, and not only now in the 21st century is is change really starting to creep into the daily life of citizens, and so the Ico are wishing to pr make sure that the changes that come with technology don't create a nation of individuals who don't care about their neighbors, who don't care about uh, duty and honor, uh, a role to play in a society that is um, not only for, for Instagram uh, influencers or, or pop stars. Uh, so they, are, they, they view themselves as defending the way of life that has made the empire strong. Uh, you know, trying to frame this all neutrally from a political standpoint. Both the ICO and the Tekken are active in, in politics, running for seats and stuff like that. It is a, a constitutional monarchy with a functioning government, and uh, the municipality has politics. And so both of these uh, factions are, are active in day-to-day -day municipal politics. Um, leaving the ICO aside, um, there's the orange umbrella, which... Now that I've said it, I've the cat's out of the bag, but it's a secret organization of two paths whose goal it is to maintain balance in the city and balance in politics and balance in all forms, such that the pendulum of past versus future, progressivism versus uh, uh, tradition, uh, uh, individualism versus collectivism never swings too far in either direction and keeps to the center of what they believe to be the true balance of the, the 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 trajectory of the empire, um, the two paths are effectively spies and assassins, um, and they execute jobs to keep 
the city on the right path, to keep the empire on its right path. Mm-hmm. By doing so, they have decided that they are the arbiters of the empire's future, which makes them, you know, they could be viewed as good or evil or or blinded or myopic or anything, but certainly makes for fun character options and, and good in-game politics. Mm-hmm. Um, following that, there's the Seven Swords, which are also a somewhat neutral, uh, but their neutrality comes down to not giving a shit about anything except money. There are two paths of mercenaries. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, they will fight for any side uh, as long as the coin is right. So they, if you want to play on a path that is uh, militant and fun and adventure but not one that has a boss hoarding over you to tell you which way, how you're supposed to feel about the politics of the region, then the Seven Swords give you this option to uh, just be a, a, a guy with a gun or a girl with a sword or a, a martial artist out there to affect change in the city, but affect change for much more uh, succinct reasons. Mm-hmm. And finally, as far as factions go, there's the Speakers, which also have two paths, of which are far more mystical, uh, the speakers are able to contact the kami, the spirits of, of Nuido, uh, in, in various different ways. And they tend to be the conduits for the kami to speak to mortals, which is something that only very rarely comes up from an aggregate you know, game lore perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you end up with uh, uh, wizards and, and um, well, uh, key-oriented... Um, it, it's... One path takes a view that the spirits are outside of us, and one takes the view that the spirits in me are enough to uh, to affect change. So two different views, but both of of a, a vague mysticism. Yeah, uh, they they are also neutral in in the you know the past versus future conflict, but they tend to view more of a natural balance as important in the city. Not to say that you wouldn't find one at a, a breakdance competition or or driving a, a sweet ride down the street. That just because they're mystical doesn't mean that they're old fashioned, dodgy wizards. Uh, but they just take a different means to whatever their ends may be. Mm-hmm. After that, there's five more paths, four more paths which don't have an overarching faction, or players that don't like having a boss or don't like being told what to do. There's uh, some paths that are chaotic anarchist bikers, mm-hmm. um, a path of techno wizards, uh, psychotic kind of matrix like prophets, mm-hmm. um, a class of monster mon- or sorry, a path of monster hunters who do have a fairly unified goal of making sure the dark doesn't encroach on all these silly games that the rest of the paths are playing with politics in modern civilization. Mm-hmm. Um, and a path of disgruntled former, uh, court magicians who have a very different style of magic, who have kind of recluse, become recluses uh, in the modern world and only come out to answer mysteries and, and, and seek knowledge, but they've got their own motivations and they, they exist a bit on the outside of, of this uh, uh, otherwise political paradigm that I've been discussing. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. Now, when it comes now, when it comes to the core, when it comes to the core mechanic, um, your you your um, I'm get. Would it be fair of me to say that you're using a d a d ten based approach with exploding die? Yeah, yeah. If for anyone that's played L five R or World of Darkness, it it is the same root trait plus skills, I call it. Uh, I'm not sure if that makes sense to everybody, but you've got a core traits of your, your, you know, just to be broad stroke terms here, your strength and your intelligence and and your speed and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then each of those core traits has skills associated with it, whether that be, you know, drive and being sneaky and in your uh, dexterity based trade or, or study and and medicine and technology in your savvy based trait so you have a dice pool that you accumulate by um adding up your core traits plus whatever dice you've got in your skill and Mm -hmm. summing the total of what you roll against a target number um that is accumulated rather than successes Mm -hmm. so all together you're looking to add up to beat a certain target number yeah in the in the game uh, the core traits use D10s, and they do explode. 
um, such that if you roll a 10, you can continue rolling that D10 again. If you get another 10, you roll again and you add them all up. Mm -hmm. uh, and that reflects the innate, you know, call it limitless bounds of our, our, of our mortal potential to get something done. Yeah. Uh, in game systems, for those not incredibly familiar with it, it provides the opportunity for even a, you know, a, even a novice to get a, a, a cheap shot in on a master. Uh, you know, even a newbie gunslinger to shoot that hand out of the air just by pure, you know, pure raw talent and or luck. Um, so that the core traits all use D10s in the dice pool. Mm -hmm. The skills use a D4, D6, D8, or D12, none of which explode. And you can choose which dice to assign, die to assign to your skills at each rank or, or dot or however you view it that you assign to that you that you purchase in that skill mm -hmm. such that if you're if you're going to drive you know drive in traffic on your motorcycle you use your reflex trait in d10s and add to it your drive skill in d4 d6 d8 or d12 and of course some are more expensive to purchase than others and in the 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 motivator for not just saving up and giving yourself a d12 and everything is that um, various skills at various levels have free bonuses and abilities that are derived from or reflective of that of that uh, skill. Mm -hmm. um, so you can take a cheap couple of D4s in a skill to get access to bonus abilities associated with that skill, mm -hmm. which is perfectly welcome in the game. It yeah. will just mean that anytime you roll that a contest using that skill, you'll be using D4s instead of D6s, 8s, or 12s. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing, one thing that I noticed with skills is, and I'm guessing this is something that will be just as prevalent in the full book, is that, is that, each, is that each skill rank after, after the first grants some, grants some, if, grants some effect. It since you mentioned L5R, it kind of reminds me of the mastery abilities that were in L5R 3rd um, and 4th edition. Maybe in 2nd edition as well, but we don't like talking about 2nd edition. <laughs> right, so yeah, so not every dot or, or rank of a skill will give you a bonus ability, mm -hmm. uh, but many do, and they, they are meant to be kind of add them together the mastery from l5r or feats from dungeons and dragons or any you know random abilities that you may get as as part of derivative rule systems from other games mm -hmm. wherein if if you just want to make a melee or a gunfighter something that you know like a quote-unquote fighter that adds flavor to the the way that you can do execute your 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 character your character's actions mm -hmm. um so as you proceed in your ability in the skills, you gain access to these little freebie fun fun abilities. Some of them are passive, you know, they'll just add to your defense, and some of them are active where they cost a meta currency and you can do something fantastic that turn. Uh, but it just creates a bit more variety and variability um, in the classic trait plus skill dice pools. Plus, it's a way for me to create that uh, internal networking or synergy um, that I referred to earlier. Internal and external. So not some of these may be, you know, if you, here, I'm just going to pull one up here. If you've got heavy melee, you know, typically used for melee weapons that you need to use two hands for, uh, once you get to rank three in it, uh, of that skill, you gain that much kinetic soak, and soak is a damage reduction to, uh, mechanic. The lore being that if you're so capable with these big weapons that you're you're able to inter you know get that weapon in the way of incoming attacks, um, that's something passive that just gets added onto your character sheet that makes it harder to hurt you. Uh, whereas another skill may give you the the ability to trigger one of your allies to have a free attack, or trigger one of your allies to pull off their own special abilities, such that it isn't just in character but it's intra character. Um, or inter-character that, that these skill ranks let your party start to add depth, synergy, and team building to, to the, the excitement of building your own character. Mm -hmm. And of course it's incredibly complicated as far as making sure that it's not broken and imbalanced 
and one combination of, of X, Y, and Z abilities between th three characters doesn't create an infinite loop of, of hit points or damage or turns or stuff like that. And, and I'm 90% of the way sure that that's not the case, but not 100%. And we'll just have to see. And that's why playtesting continues and, and the game continues to be refined. And with that, with that in mind, I know I've I know I've compared uh, I know I've compared um this game this game to L five R in in certain aspects, and I don't I don't want to I don't want to make and I don't I don't want to make it seem like that's going to be the sole point of comparison. But I have to bring them up one more time, and that is on the question of squishiness. Mm-hmm. Because L5R is notorious for having having characters who are very squishy, where a few a few good hits will take will take them out. Um. So certainly at the start of this game, that's possible. Uh, this is a slightly less unforgiving game than L5R or mothership or one of these ones where you just know you're going to die and character creation's quick so whip up another one and go out and die again and groundhog day it um with the the length of time it takes and investment it takes to make a character in this game i didn't want to make it too easy to just go off and get killed on day one that being said it's a far cry from dungeons and dragons where it's almost impossible to get killed after level two or level three uh, unless you fall in a volcano or something um the range of squishiness between characters is fairly high. Um, the, your health pool is based on a core trait called heart, and anyone can take high heart. Uh, any of the lineages can boost it. Any path can boost it. There's nothing to say that you can't be a, a wise and old spellcaster dude with tons of heart and tons of hit points. Um, the range of hit points at the start of the game is anything from 20, as like you can't get lower than that, to I think somebody min maxed up to seventy three at at level one or day one, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and average hits in the game can be between you know five to seven points, but they do use d tens. So exploding d tens on a somebody shooting a gun at you has the potential to do a, a hell of a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. So uh, day one characters have the potential to be murdered, but it's. I don't find it that common. Now, a, a blind playtesting play group reported that two of their characters died last weekend, surprisingly, after a few sessions of play, actually, which I was kind of happy to hear about. Um, you know, it didn't destroy their, their enjoyment of the game, but it certainly proved that this isn't just another adventure lark where a bunch of heroes go out and can't get hurt and become mini-gods immediately. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make that, that danger threat a reality because I do like the potential of a a novice swordsman defeating a master uh, with a lucky stroke. Um, the the question of squishiness has one derivative that is the only meta currency in the game is called legend, and it's something that you earn by doing cool stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, legend determines your rank in your path, which is as close to an analog of classes that the game has. Um, but it is also the fuel for your abilities, both for magic abilities and martial abilities. And so characters can choose to burn more or less of their temporary legend to fuel fantastic actions, including just saying I'd like to add some legend to this next role because I want to, you know, shoot an apple off that guy's head from 200 meters. Okay, well, you can never hit that, but, you know, add some legend and maybe you'll get it done. The flip side of that coin is that temporary legend can be used as a reserve of health. So once you burn through all of your health and you get some penalties to your, your rolls, you don't die until all of your temporary legend gets burned up as well. The lore or meta here is that characters are all supposed to be legends, and we've, we've, we haven't even touched on that, um, with their own personal agenda and their own theme and... and they're supposed to build up their own legend as they play through the world of Nuido. And this is a world where belief defines reality. The belief of the, the human population created these other lineages. Uh, they just believed in them for so long that they became real, and then they became part of everyday life. But when legend is a literal reflection of how many people know of you and believe in you, you gain a little bit of immortality from that. Such that after you've been shot twice in the head by a pistol, 
and you're you know you're knocked down and bleeding out, you still have a chance based on your temporary legend as a, a last store of hit points to to keep going to be that samurai on the bridge with fifty arrows stuck in them, still fighting off enemies. Um, that that really adds the 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 heroics to the game, which which certainly the game is aimed at at heroics and high flying adventures. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, uh, characters and players who appreciate a play style of using a bit more over the top um, magic, for example, will burn through their backup reserve hit points quicker, uh, making them more squishy, mm-hmm. which is a balancing mechanism because characters that get to use magic and, and wacky powers like that have, tend to have more tools in the toolbox, much, much like a magic using class from any other game. Um, and, and, is balanced by the fact that if they use all those tools, they will become more squishy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I appreciate I appreciate that balance. And some games like to um, like to like to give way too much attention to their casters. Hi D and D, how you doing? <laughs> oh. Yeah, casters in this game. I mean, it, it, magic. I have to admit is actually fairly muted in the game. The spells are literally called rotes. The etymology of being something that is static, you know, you have to do it in a very pr- prescribed way. It only creates a fairly prescribed outcome. This is not a Mage the Gathering style game where magic is fluid. Uh, the world is that kind of world, but this game is not that game. Um, so there's only if, you know, you're, uh, a magic based character at day one may have access to three, four, possibly five if they're really gung ho with all of their priorities. Uh, ropes, spells at the start mm-hmm. and as you go through your, your ranks in the game, it's unlikely to ever gain more than you know, 8, 10 different ropes t- to your name mm-hmm. uh, and how often you can cast those ropes is, is based on your, your meta f- currency, the legend mm-hmm. uh, so at the start, you know you can cast it 2 or 3 times or cast them 2 or 3 times and by the end you can cast them 12, 15, 18 times between having to refuel Excuse me, um, but uh, but it is it's not meant to be a high fantasy game. Um, magic is certainly something that is not common in the world. There might be immortal samurai that have been walking the streets for two hundred years, but it's not magic. It's just their legend. It's just the belief of everybody that how badass they are that keeps them alive. Whereas um, entities casting spells and becoming invisible and throwing fireballs simply does not exist. Uh, but more subtle or muted magical effects are possible, but far less common in the world. Yeah, and it'll always result in someone taking out their cell phone and, and putting you on the internet. Mm-hmm. Now, one particular mechanic within within characters, since we're talking about these legendary, larger than life um, figures in some regard, that I want to touch on is what you call the fate card. How did that come about, and how, and I'd like you to give the audience a bit of a taster on how it works. So the fate card's genesis is my believing strongly that people make their own fate, or at least you, you can have a hand in it. Um, I, I recently put up an incredibly lengthy post on this on Reddit, so I may just refer back to that specifically, but... Uh, of a personal real world belief that you make your own luck. You can't always time it and you can't, you know, you can't define reality based on your own luck, but you can put yourself in the right place and just wait for the right time. Mm -hmm. Preparation, attitude, uh, effort, all these things contribute to what other people will see as luck. Um, Oh, he just got lucky. Well, actually he was working on that for years kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to find a way to build that concept into the game um, without, you know, railroading players or making the game about fate or something like that. Uh, because the, the concept of fate ties in nicely with the legend of characters supposed to be heroes, and if they don't quite make it, then that was just their fate. Um, so the fate card is a D100 percentage chance system that is added in front of most contested roles which many game players initially will roll your eyes at, another dice roll. Mm -hmm. Um, But what it is, is a chance for exciting, interesting, and fun things to happen to augment the actions on your turn. Mm -hmm. The very basic uh, fates are crit and botch. Um, 
And it, you, you roll a D100 before you roll your attack. The D100 quite often will come up with nothing at the start of the game, and then you move on and do your attack as usual. Mm -hmm. uh, the paths all provide their power is based on a fate. Uh, they've, they've got auxiliary powers or, or smaller boosts or bonuses, but each of the paths provide you a fate, a percentage chance of some fate occurring on your turn. Um, and they vary wildly. Uh, you know, the Saibishi are mechanics, and you've got a fit at the day one a 15 or 20% chance of taking, of boosting ally tech, including your own, or taking over enemy tech um, to, you know, derail it for the turn or shut down an augmentation or break a techie gun, that kind of thing. Um, the Boar clan are kind of berserker samurai who have a chance to roll dismember. Mm -hmm. And that, if they roll Dismember on their turn, they get to double all their damage dice, and if they also have a higher Legend than their target, they will remove a limb from that target, assuming the target survives. Fun stuff like that that is derived from the fun we get when we're playing video games, and crazy stuff is always procking off your weapons or your equipment or whatever it may be. That's hard to recreate in RP tabletop RPGs. Mm -hmm. um, so the Fate card mechanic layers in all these percentage chance Fates Anything from take an extra turn, regain some hit points or temporary legend, to assign an ally a free attack, uh, assign an ally free movement, um, and then the bigger and broader and more powerful ones associated with your, your path. Mm -hmm. um, the fate card is a part of your character sheet that just has, you know, it doesn't have 100 lines on it because many of these things have more than 1% chance. Uh, but you fill it up as you play with the chance for fun shit to happen. You roll it before your turn, it may define already that you don't have to roll anything else because you got a crit, or because of something else the fate says. Um, the fates themselves are built off of integration of skills, uh, augmentations, and your path. But to, to add to the narrative storytelling creativity that I'm trying to foster in, at the table, if you are the kind of player that always has a fun, creative solution to a problem, or just a fun way to go about playing, the storyteller is encouraged to assign your character fates associated with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so say, for example, that you're a, uh, an, an adventurous type that likes to swing from chandeliers and stand up on the back of chairs and have them tip over and fun shit like that. And whenever you go to attack somebody with your sword, you always describe, just narratively, some fun, wacky way that you get things done within whatever's available to you in the room. Mm -hmm. Nuido storytellers are encouraged to say, tell you what, Add a 5% chance to your fate card suggesting that you gain advantage, a mechanical advantage this turn, using some furniture in the room or using some, some contextual, uh, uh, you know, something that would otherwise just be part of the scenery. So that character is no longer just describing a fun way that they're swinging from the chandeliers, but they also gain advantage on it. And it highlights their fate or their, their unique play style with mechanical bonuses on top of just the RP fun. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a motivator to add playing depth without forcing you to do so. There's, no, there's nothing forcing any players to have to describe everything wacky. If, if players are just the type that like to third-person their characters, you can say, I'd like to shoot uh, the, my enemy, and you're rolling your fate, and if nothing comes up, then you go on, you roll your attack, and off you go and shoot the person. Mm -hmm. It's not the kind of game where you have to be an over-the-top actor or... or you don't have to, you're not forced to come up with some creative way or wacky way to get things done every time. Mm -hmm. Now, with, the, with, that in, with that in mind, um, the, next, the next angle that I'd, that I'd, like, to go, I'd like to go into is, um, is there's been a whole lot of customization, and I'm, cur I'm curious if that customization also extends to equipment. Yep, highly. Um, it isn't a equipment game. Um, there's a list of weapons and some armor and grenades and, you know, standard stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, two pages worth. Uh, the quick start includes, I'd say, 80% of it. And this isn't the kind of game where if you get the, the Mauser 99.16x, blah, 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 it's dramatically different than the Mauser 199214 because of X, Y, and Z attachment that you can make. Not yeah, that kind of game. I'm pretty sure we just pissed off every gun nut I know, but I don't care. 
<laughs> well, I tell you what, there's lots of games out there, and if you come join the the Discord, uh, the the Nuido Discord, one of one of my strongest proponents in there is building a game like that, a very crunchy, you know, combat realism and or or technical detail games. Uh, and I appreciate that that's a play style, and 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 it's an intelligent and detailed one, but it is not not this game. That that level of of customization is more targeted for characters than for equipment. Now that being said, um, equipment can be modified and crafted in game. Uh, there's vehicles which can also be modified in game. Uh, I haven't built a system for building vehicles from scratch yet, but but you can make your own equipment and you can modify your equipment and vehicles such that it is rewarding to be a mechanic in the game. Now mechanics, you still gotta. You know, one of the paths is basically a mechanic uh, or an equipment modifier who's still capable in a fight. Um, but it, it provides enough of that that creative depth such that if you want to have a, you know, you, 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 you want to take two katanas and, and go to somebody and have them meld them together into a strange hybrid fantasy weapon, mm -hmm. sure, we can probably get that done. And your storyteller will be encouraged to assign certain fairly structured parameters to either a bonus or a new way to use that weapon such that it doesn't break the game but it allows you to be creative mm -hmm. um so so equipment and vehicle modification and crafting is a a second part of the game and is certainly not core but for players that enjoy that 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 type of mini game as it were uh you'll find it in new Vito. Mm -hmm. now with that with that in mind i first i want to i want to congratulate you on Man on managing to get almost three times over your initial um, goal. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, actually, no. Actually, sorry, sorry, I have to correct myself because I was looking at it as it was converted from um, USD. But the the original goal you had is, was sixty five hundred Canadian, and it's currently at eighteen point two th um, thousand Canadian. So you did go three times over. Not quite two hundred and eighty percent, but it is far, far exceeded what my 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 dreams were for this Kickstarter. This is my first Kickstarter. Frankly, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I did a lot of research in advance, though, <laughs> and 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 plowed a lot of effort and, and frankly some money um, into presenting this as best as possible. Mm -hmm. But this is my first game. Um, I, until this summer, was not highly active in, in online communities. I'm kind of an old school analog. Mm -hmm. um, and that has been to my detriment. Um, joining communities for, for feedback and to learn from, from people who have done this before mm -hmm. helped, dramatically helped, the success of this, this Kickstarter. Um, and, but, I mean, even all of that being said, I, I am flabbergasted and blown away and proud and super excited about what this means uh, and by the, the very, very, very positive feedback that Nuido has received with its 120-page quick start that's out there. Quick start is obviously a misnomer. Um, but, you know, I've kind of put myself out there here. I didn't give away everything for free. I want you to come back and, and can't wait to get the, the hardcover book into your hands and flip through the final version mm -hmm. uh, with all of the extended rules. But I wanted to put enough out there that I could get feedback on the, the core systems, things like Fate Card. Is this a dumb idea? Are people going to enjoy it? People at my tables enjoy it, but will the broader gaming community enjoy another role? Mm -hmm. uh, it, the answer so far has been yes, because it, it, it's a fun lottery is basically what it's come out to. Oh, man, I can't wait to roll my Fate and see what the hell happens this turn. And that's what you want, right? Excitement from players for your, your systems. Um, but, but the, the, the success of this Kickstarter is, it just means that this book is going to be a beautiful goddamn book. <laughs> and I just hope that the, uh, the systems and the lore and all of that excite people as much as the art that I've been able to commission for it, uh, have already done so. And just to be clear, there's no, there's no profit in any of this. <laughs> With $18,000 that's going to be spent on New Edo. And whatever the hell end target is, is all going back into this game. So I have a day job that pays my bills, and I'm very excited to see what, what, how, how this campaign ends and what it will allow me to do with this game. Mm -hmm. And with, and I will, I will certainly be looking forward to to seeing how it how it develops. But 
with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. I, I appreciate you reaching out and the chance to uh, talk about my baby. Mm -hmm. uh, you may have noticed that I enjoy it thoroughly, um, but uh, it's been an honor and, and, and thanks for your guidance as I ramble on here and I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And and anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further go into Nuetto or to or to um, or or to or to just sh or to just shit post, the door is always open. <laughs> As I always say, around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, next time we schedule one of these, we won't do it in the AM. <laughs> And, and, and now that I've rambled on for an hour and change about the game, next time I can a little, be a little bit more loose about things. So I'll, how about I come back mm -hmm. after this campaign finishes and we can talk about the end of the campaign and where next steps are for the game and its uh, progress towards getting hard books into your hands. Yeah. Uh, and of course, a sincere, and sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>